Hello, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Ron Alasco from International Trade Council. Thank you for attending uh, today's educational session. Before we start, I will just going to do a quick housekeeping. Um, if you can hear the audio, please type in yes in the chat box. And if you can also see the PowerPoint presentation. Thank you. Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for um, the confirmation. So um, for today's um, educational session, our topic is open banking finance, a paradigm shift with endless possibilities. Our speaker for today is Tala Oshin uh, from FinTech Galaxy, and he is a senior product manager. This webinar explores the transformative potential of open banking and finance, focusing on key learning outcomes. Participants gain insight into how open finance is revolutioning core aspect of daily life uncovering opportunities for innovation and growth. The discussion highlights the streamlining of payment processes across various sectors, emphasizing efficiency and reduce friction for customers and providers. Moreover, the webinar explained the power of data-driven decision-making, showcasing its importance in understanding customers and optimizing operation. Practical application across diverse industries from retail to insurance demonstrate how open banking is reshaping payment solutions, customer experiences, and operational efficiency, ultimately paving the way for a dynamic future landscape. Now, let's hear directly from our esteemed speaker who will elaborate the topic. Please join me in welcoming Tala Ashen. Go ahead, Tala. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. And um, as Ron so well put, we'll be covering the topic of open banking and finance today and looking at all of the different ways in which it has a massive potential to have impacts on a variety of different uh, industries, use cases, and looking a bit deeper into what those applications are likely to look like in uh, the short term, medium term, and long term. So um, just a brief introduction around myself. My name is Tala uh, I'm a senior product manager. I've been in the product space for uh, eight years now. So my background is predominantly within the payment space. Uh, I started my career at Barclays and have moved out into the UAE working for a variety of companies uh, covering a variety of different payment requirements and services. Um, I've been in the open banking space for a little over a year now, but I had previously had a variety of experience uh, that I had touched upon open banking um, in that time. And just to briefly go over our agenda, so we will go over a variety of topics, starting with where we are now, um, where we perceive uh, things can go from an open banking and finance perspective, uh, having a look at the evolution of payments, um, the concept of unlocking the power of data, the process of implementing open banking use cases, and then we'll have some time towards the end for questions. So where are we now? So the history of open banking can be traced back to pretty early stages in around 1980s, where there was early experimentation happening uh, in Germany and looking at how the concept of enabling external computers of, uh, to access and operate uh, banking, uh, banking products for private customers or private users. So the idea was marketed as um, my bank in my living room and allowed users to make online transfers using a code and kind of set the, the, the basis for what a lot of the current open banking and open finance concepts are built upon. Um, and then we won't go into too much detail around each and every step, but then by 2007, PSD1 came about. Uh, and introduced the rise of payment service providers. So the European Commission introduced in the first payment service directive, uh, which was aimed at creating a more open and competitive market, particularly within the payment services space within the European Union and facilitated, as mentioned, the emergence of uh, PSPs who are a key participant in the open banking framework, particularly on the, uh, on the payment initiation side. 
And then around 2015, 2016, we, we reached the rise of open APIs and regulatory pushes, which started to enable or started to see where we started to see a variety of countries um, beginning to take on a lot of these frameworks and introduce the concept of uh, open API frameworks, uh, a much stronger push from a regulatory perspective to actually enable these technologies and allow for access to things such as account information and payment initiation services directly through integrations with the bank. And 2018 is where we saw PSD2, which was where I'd say open banking really started to take off in its current form. Um, the framework in, uh, that was put in place during, uh, as part of PSD2 really defined what we know now as the model around how PIS, uh, PISPs and AISPs interact with, uh, with the financial institutions. And just for clarity, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, like AISPs are account information service providers, PISPs are payment initiation service providers. So those are the essentially the third parties that access the banks on behalf of the end user to enable a variety of use cases on both the account information and payment initiation side. And then finally, we come to the present day where we're seeing the global expansion and innovation of open banking. So the implementation of these frameworks across the globe, we have places like Brazil, Nigeria, uh, KSA, uh, the UAE, Bahrain. So there's so many countries that have, and many of which have actually taken uh, a leaf out of the European Union's book and out of the book of the UK and looked at how those frameworks have been implemented there and decided about how best to actually transform those frameworks and get the most out of it in their own country. So um, definitely a consistent belief in the idea that open banking and open finance definitely has a place in the financial market and in the manner in which we interact with banks. Um, but it's interesting to see the small nuances and changes that each and every regulator actually goes about um, implementing these frameworks, which we, we can discuss in a bit more detail um, later on in the, in the presentation. So this is just a high level overview of, of where the global status is as of 2023 in regards to the implementation of, of open banking frameworks. And as you can see, the vast majority very much regulatory driven, which um, is from my perspective, the, the manner in which makes the most sense, at least if you want to ensure for quick and, and, and consistent um, uptake of these services. Um, but then there are other places such as the US who have left it to the market to define and drive the formatting which uh, the open banking capabilities are actually uh, taken on and implemented. And that does lead to scenarios where the banks are a lot more, um, I would say, engaged in the implementation of these services as it's a choice as opposed to a requirement. But as mentioned previously, there is that trade-off as to whether or not uh, things are actually taken on as quickly. So if we take a step back and understand what the key concept is behind uh, e e e open banking, at least from a technical perspective, um, as you can see here, the traditional model would be such that a user would be able to access a specific bank through a third party only if that third party had a direct relationship with that bank. So if you wanted to have some form of payment, financial, uh, personal financial management application, uh, that platform would have to have a way to actually access the data, which was not necessarily available uh, from a specific bank. And over time, that led to a scenario where uh, it restricted the ability for third parties to really actually take part in, in offering services outside of what a specific bank defined or allowed or what a specific uh, financial services provider defined or allowed. Uh, 
Um, and if we move over to the regulated APIs model, we have the concept now where through a regulated framework, these third parties are now able to access data services from multiple banks as defined by the regulatory requirements, enabling them to then build a vast and much broader variety of, of services, uh, enable a much broader variety of use cases uh, without having to build that direct uh, relationship with each and every financial institution um, that their users interact with. And the fundamental concept here is that this allows a lot more autonomy on the third party side. It allows for them to focus on areas that uh, the banks might not want to focus on based on other priorities that other third parties might not want to focus on based on maybe a lack of expertise and allows for a lot of innovation to occur within those specific um, within those specific areas. And I use personal finance management as an example, but there's a broad variety of use cases which we can go into um, shortly. So the banking reinvention quadrant. Um, so this whole uh, quadrant was defined or designed by uh, Paolo Cer uh, Cerrone. Um, and he stated that this is the key to winning in the new economy. Uh, according to Paolo, um, the requirement is to invest heavily in increasing your information quotient and communication quotient, uh, quotient, sorry. And if we look at the axes on the graph along the uh, X axis, we have the movement from trans tra traditional banking to data driven to transparent and this defines the manner in which any form of communication is handled so uh, traditional was very much or is very much the concept of a communication being completely handled within the infrastructure of the bank uh, completely managed by that institution and any form of information that comes out of that institution is defined by the institution alone um, but then as we move down the communication quotient it starts to move towards a more demand driven uh, demand driven space where things become a lot more transparent and data and the concept of communication becomes a lot more open and if we look at the information quotient um, there's the concept of moving from output economies to outcome economies so the idea is not anymore to just produce and provide products that uh, will be used by a given end user, but it is to focus on enabling a specific outcome, uh, looking at the journeys that a user goes through and looking at how that journey can best uh, be best catered to, even if it's utilizing the same product, how does that product get implemented in these various different use cases to ensure that the outcome is solved for and as you can see, as we move further outwards from traditional banking, we move into concepts such as digital banking, um, a concept such as conscious banking, and where conscious banking is the idea of where you're still aware of the fact that there is a banking partner or a banking provider behind these services, but they are starting to become a lot more integrated into your day-to-day -day journeys, whether that is making a payment directly through your um, directly through your uh, e and e-commerce platforms website and initiating that payment from your bank account whether that is doing a credit risk assessment utilizing account information provided by your bank um, the services are enabled by those bank partners and then contextual banking where we have vast and embedded finance also expands upon that looking at how the banks then get to a point where it's almost no longer visible in that interaction, whether it is you opening a digital wallet that is in the background being managed or being supported through some form of BAS integration that allows for a bank account to be the custodial account for those digital wallets, like that no longer becomes relevant to you as a user because at the end of the day, your focus is on the outcome, which is the utilization or, and the services provided through 
that um, that digital wallet that you've now opened. So um, pivoting from output to outcome economies is the core concept here and definitely aligns with the ideas that are driven by open banking and open finance. So where can we go from here? So overall, if we look at where open banking sits in the concept of an open economy, um, of course, open banking starts with the access to financial data and payments. But then if we take a step further, we can then look at open finance, which looks at a much broader variety of, of, of uh, services and concepts to access outside of just a bank account and looking at insurance data, pension information, mortgages, um, unsecured lending, asset management, all of these are different aspects of an individual's financial persona, which can be utilized and through the idea of open banking and an open economy is information that is technically owned by the end user and should be accessible by that end user to ensure that they have access to the best services that align with their needs and their wants. And then we get to an even broader concept, which is open data, which again enables you to access the data that is being generated on your behalf by a telco, utility, companies, healthcare, retail. All of this is again, a part of your digital footprint that allows for you to then, or should allow for you to then take that information or take those services and enable yourself to access capabilities that best suit your needs as opposed to being restricted to capabilities that um, are offered by the uh, service provider that you're currently with. And this is why the concept of open banking, open finance, open data is so closely linked to the idea of improving and increasing competitiveness because the core underlying reason for a lot of this is it's supposed to give the end user the best opportunity to find the best solution to their specific problems. And um, just a bit more of an expansion on what we previously discussed. So um, as of now in the open banking space, we have the open, open accounts and information to so the AISPs supporting things such as account aggregation, um, open payments, which uh, the PISP is enable to, uh, or are there to enable the opportunity to initiate payments from your account and utilize those services. We get into open finance, look at curated marketplaces and aggregators, alternative credit scoring and flow-based lending. I think that is a very interesting one because as of now, there is still a lot of, uh, quite a restriction on the manners in which a particular entity can go about assessing an individual's credit score, particularly if the uh, end user isn't already one of their customers. And looking at how open banking and open finance could be used to really remove some of the barriers to entry when it comes to understanding an individual's credit worthiness is something that I believe have, will have a massive impact on uh, on a global scale. Um, and then, of course, the open economy is where we believe we'll get to eventually. And that is the idea of literally all of your data being something that you can access and utilize in a manner that uh, you best seem fit or deem fit. And then uh, as a, and also of course embedded finance and banking as a service are core aspects of uh, the open finance side of things. And um, BAS operates slightly differently, I would say to open banking as a slightly different concept, but the underlying reasoning or the underlying uh, goal is more or less very much aligned. So uh, this again, as mentioned earlier, the idea of enabling a public facing brand or public facing entity to utilize these services that are provided by a bank in the background to achieve a variety of capabilities that would otherwise not be possible for that uh, uh, user facing platform. So digital wallet example was one provided, but this could be utilized for the concept of enabling loan issuance at the point of sale, for example. Uh, let's say you're a digital car 
to provide a digital car marketplace and do you want to enable your users to uh, be able to obtain a car loan directly through your through your platform so the idea of actually having that integration directly with the banks to one carry out the assessment on the individual utilize the bank's uh, loan um, loan initiation infrastructure and having that as part of your core journey is something that uh, again goes to what moves us towards a place where we are much better aligned with taking the user from uh, an end to end uh, through an end to end journey as opposed to what currently happens where that journey is often broken you select your car that you want to buy in the di on a digital platform but then might be required to then go and obtain that uh, that loan through your bank directly and one bank or the bank that you bank with or that your salary is with is the bank that is most likely to actually approve your loan in comparison to others who don't have your data so there's a lot of blockers that are disable or don't allow for a user to actually get potentially the best option or the best outcome in these journeys which um open banking open finance pass and all of these concepts are hopefully in place or will be in place for us to help solve for and then if we look at from a much broader scope all of the different areas in which the potential for open banking and bus uh, have to, uh, to impact on the personal banking landscape so um, as of now of course if we look at the various concepts or the various um, uh, activities and instruments that are utilized by an individual you have the concept when it comes to their banks there's deposits or the instruments they use to uh, access and manage their, their uh, access and manage their funds, the ability to initiate payments, lending, investment, wealth management, and the direct banking services, as we can see here, are all aligned with those specific uh, concepts. But then, when we move out into the banking as a service side of things, we can look at how those initial direct banking services can be translated over into more contextual banking services so um, as opposed to necessarily having a multi-currency account uh, that is offered by our bank directly then we can move into the concept of virtual accounts or uh, access to regulated or unregulated currencies and wallets that are linked directly to or that are based off of the access to data and payments from your original account. Um, the idea of virtual account, virtual card issuance, so something that is becoming a lot more common, ability to issue virtual cards are linked to a digital wallet, which is funded by your bank account. Um, bespoke payment networks and services, so looking at how uh, many platforms can build their own internal payment infrastructure that is catered towards uh, like a sub economy that exists within that within that network in itself so um, looking at how in gaming the concept can expand to a place where um, there is an entire economy that is being funded and managed through of course the funding coming from banks but through a a infrastructure that actually exists outside of the bank. Um, so these are just some of the examples of how banking as a service and embedded finance uh, leads us to replace the more contextual banking, as was mentioned earlier, where the services are not explicitly or as explicitly uh, linked to the banks, but are more uh, focused on the service that is provided as opposed to who is actually providing the underlying capability. And now we'll jump into the evolution of payments, so just to understand how they fit into the overall open banking landscape. Um, so just from a high level perspective, I'm sure most of us are quite acquainted with the current concepts around how general payments work but um, of course you have the electronic funds transfers which underpin the vast majority of payments so the idea of electronically moving money which in reality is the idea of messaging and aligning and validating those messages between parties to ensure that when one party sends funds to another 
then those funds are actually accounted for in the, uh, from, from both sides of the transaction. Um, and then of course, the introduction of cards allowed for a much more flexible manner in which users could access funds from their accounts and make payments in comparison to the, to the need for cash previously, it essentially allowed them access to all of their funds directly through um, a given card as well as credit, the idea of prepaid cards and so on and so forth. And of course, cryptocurrencies, which is still relatively, I would say new um, in the sense of how deeply it has become integrated into the current financial infrastructure, but um, definitely something to keep an eye on whether we're looking at it from a, a central bank digital coin perspective or also the actual concept of utilizing and crypto other cryptocurrencies uh, in their own form or in their own manner going back to the case of gaming for example looking at many of the uh, new cryptocurrency platforms are built around the concept of that coin being used as the uh, core core the uh, core currency within a given within a given gaming economy so um, definitely a, an area of of great opportunity and something that we we can discuss in a bit more detail later on. Uh, there is always a question as to whether or not open banking payment solutions can actually replace cards. And just from a super, like from our high level perspective, I think there are benefits uh, to both. So uh, the idea around open banking payments is that there will be reduced costs due to fewer players being involved in, in, in the end-to-end -end journey of actually initiating those payments, um, greater control and transparency, particularly on the end user's perspective, from the end user's perspective. So the introduction of things like variable recurring payments uh, allow for a much more, uh, I guess, a, a, a much more detailed manner in which a user can define how payments now and in the future are initiated with a given party and also allows for uh, the party on the other side to have a lot more possible a lot more of a possibility of seeing the the uh, end to end journey of that payment going through so whether it's through direct status updates from the bank all of this information is usually provided through the open banking integration of course, there's the promotion of innovation. So um, I would say open banking payments gives a lot more of an opportunity for bank uh, for third parties, sorry, to build out solutions on top of as opposed to cards, which are in somewhat somewhat much more of a closed uh, a closed uh, a economy. Is that the best word? Probably not, but. Um, the idea here in open banking is that the uh, API infrastructure is in place for these TPPs to come, take these services and build out capabilities that uh, might not have been thought of initially. So um, definitely a key benefit there. Uh, security. So of course, uh, with all of the infrastructures that have been put in place over the years there is definitely a massive amount of security in place when it comes to the utilization of cards but um, i say the removal of the card in the journey removes one step or one uh, potential area of security lapse which is the ability to initiate a payment directly from someone's card especially for contactless payments or for um like even for card not present payments where the value is low enough for the transaction to go through while in the open banking case there's a lot more in place to actually ensure for uh the need for that verification in each and every scenario um and it gives the bank a lot more control also as to how frequently an individual needs to be uh, validated and authenticated and ensures or gives that responsibility onto the bank who uh, who initially who are responsible for that account. And um, if we look at settlement speeds, uh, the idea again is that it's an account to account transaction. So re removing any intermediaries in most cases will lead to the idea of a payment being almost instant again dependent on the payment rails that are available within a given country but 
um, as opposed to, in most cases, the idea of a third party being in place, capturing that payment and then making that settlement once everything is cleared. The idea is that the transactions between those two parties directly. So a massive range of, of benefits to the open banking payment side of things. But then, of course, on cards, there are also many benefits on that end. And we have, of course, the global presence and standards. So a big piece um, uh, or a big factor when looking at the comparison between open banking payments and cards is that as of now, cards, particularly if we look at schemes such as Visa and MasterCard are global and you're able to utilize your Visa card in most cases in whichever country that you visit. Similarly for your MasterCard, in many cases for your American Express, all of these different schemes are, are accepted worldwide. But then if we look at the open banking side of things, it is a bit more restricted because the regulatory uh, uh, framework has been defined on a country per country basis. And it means that the underlying uh, open banking infrastructure in a given country probably doesn't take into account the uh, infrastructure of another country. So if a platform has merchant payments enabled, it's probably, if I'm in the EU, only going to allow me to actually access and initiate a payment from an EU bank account. So that is something that I'm sure in the long term uh, will start to become something that it becomes more of a consideration from a regulatory perspective around how they collaborate across different frameworks uh, and across geographies. But as of now, that's definitely an area that um, cards definitely have a, a benefit when it comes to and um, the existing infrastructure also pertains to a similar concept. Um, the card infrastructure is already in place and global and allows for uh, that easy transition regardless of which region you're in. Of course, the customer uh, consumer protection rights have been defined and matured over years in many countries when it comes to cards. So the idea of chargebacks and things of that nature are already baked into the core journey of a card payment, particularly when it comes to credit cards. Um, and the open banking is a lot more uh, is in a much earlier stage and therefore that is not something that's necessarily as consistent across the board. Um, and then of course on the card side, less reliance on the banks for uh, uh, banks regarding to innovation. So um, one area in which open banking will still continue to be reliant on banks is that the services that are provided and the access to um, to let's say, uh, the, the particular services through a, those APIs required the banks to actually implement those APIs on behalf of the framework or def as defined by the framework and to ensure that they are of a given standard. So there is still a lot of reliance on ensuring the banks operate in a manner that allows for the progression of, of, um, of, of the open banking space. So um, in my personal opinion, after going through all of the different pros and cons on both sides, I think open banking at payments don't necessarily come to replace cards, but are definitely an option that will become a lot more prevalent in your payment journey. And I think it's something that complements the concept of a card, but and also enables you to, again, that flexibility to decide and define how you want to pay. So using VRPs again as an example, the ability to have that uh, complete control over your subscription payments outside of the subscriber's platform. So I, I set up a subscription with Netflix that instead of having to go into Netflix and then, or Amazon Prime to cancel that subscription, I can simply go into my banking app and cancel the VRPs that are related to any of the platforms I no longer want to subscribe to which will lead to that information being provided or shared with that provider and allows for a more centralized manner in which I can then control my finances. And this is something that is not necessarily available uh, out of the box from a, a card side of things and um, definitely gives you a lot more control as mentioned. So um, I think that is a key thing that we'll continue to see. There'll be particular use cases in which the open banking payment solutions will dominate in comparison to cards and other use cases where card will continue to be the best option, but at least we give the users the opportunity to make that decision. So, and if we look at the market impact uh, of a few places that have already implemented 
uh, open banking capabilities. So, uh, so as defined, as stated by um, the Open Banking Opportunities Competitor uh, Leaderboard and Market Forecast for 2023 to 2027, uh, open banking payments are due to pass 330 billion by 2027. And if we look at a few countries that have implemented frameworks, we can see that in Brazil, uh, less than two years after its launch, Brazil's open finance ecosystem reported over 27 million customers with 41 million accounts participating as of September 2023. Um, the UK uh, year-to-date uh, ju- data for July 2023 against 2022 demonstrated that uh, total payments have doubled, showing an exceptional 102% uh, growth surpassing 11.4 million payments. Um, in Nigeria, uh, there was a recent survey that showed that 68% of businesses surveyed were um, now using open banking frameworks and uh, they were seeing that the, they were spending 8% less on payment processing than those who uh, were yet to op- uh, adopt open banking. And finally, if we look at Europe, uh, according to a Statistica report, um, in May, the growth of open banking is is moving rapidly in Europe as well, and is expected to see nearly uh, 64 million users uh, by 2024, and that's an increase of over 400% in just four years. So I think just some of this, oh, this data put, uh, gives us an, an insight into, I guess, the need that open banking and open finance is starting to fill, there's definitely uh, a way to go in terms of its development and in terms of its uptake. And it's definitely not a one size fits all uh, solution, but there's definitely a drive within the market to actually utilize these services and some core benefits that not enabled or not able or you're not able to access through other tools or other other concepts so um, i think it's a great example of how um these capabilities are actually being being taken aboard and uh going back to the payment concept i think vrps are one of the payment concepts or the payment use cases that i find most interesting when it comes to open banking and something that has a massive range of different applicable uh, use cases so um, of course, we have the two types of payments. We have both uh, sweeping and non-sweeping. Um, and when we go into uh, on the non-sweeping side of things, there's a variety of different manners in which VRPs can be utilized. So subscription payments, I think, are the most uh, common concept that people think of when thinking about a variable recurring payment. So I set up a subscription, let's say, for my mobile phone bill that states I'm going to pay 500 dirham a month or however much I'm due to pay but then I also set an upper limit that allows me to go slightly over that if I want to add any add-ons uh, and it all allows for that money to be automatically uh, initiated or that payment to be automatically initiated from my account. Well if we look at other use cases which are also somewhat or you could say somewhat uh, defined as uh, virtual recurring payments um, we have the idea of, um, apologies. So, yeah, we have the idea of retail payments, apologies, where an individual will, is able to set up a one click payment concept because of the fact that they have defined their virtual, um, their uh, payment, their payment, uh, sorry their variable recurring payment scheme with a given retailer that allows for on-demand payments to be initiated up to a certain value. So it allows or covers the concept of of um, one-click payments during your retail journey, while also giving you the ability to define a upper limit of that, the maximum number of payments that can be made within a given period of time, um, and definitely gives a bit more flexibility and control on, to the customer around the one-click payment journey in comparison to card where it's somewhat down to the actual uh, platform themselves as to how frequently they want you to verify your card details, for example. So there's a lot of interesting ways in which I think VRPs can be used outside of just what comes to mind. And if we also go into sweeping, the idea of easily moving funds across your different accounts, I think are all 
are all, all concepts or are all manners of handling money that is somewhat outside of of the scope of how things are handled as of now, uh, if that makes sense, and gives a lot of opportunity for some significant uh, innovation with regards to our day-to-day interactions, both with our own finances as well as uh, with regards to how we spend those finances and interact with one another. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, we already kind of covered this slide somewhat. So we'll jump over into unlocking the power of data. So uh, there's a variety of use cases that we can discuss in regards to the unlocking the power of data. So if we have credit scoring, financial management and advisory, like KYC, fraud mitigation, behavioral analysis. So even without open banking, uh, our data, financial data is used for a variety of use cases. So if we look at a bank that we bank with specifically, then or if we go for a loan with them, they're able to do some form of credit scoring and assessment, not just uh, based off of um, what is provided by the credit bureau, but also on the data that they have on us, which allows for them to build a much better and clearer perspective of who we are from a financial uh, from a financial standpoint, and make a much more uh, a much better decision around whether we are a risk, uh, whether we are worthy or not of a given credit product. Financial management and advisory, another case in which we are aware that banks can utilize our data if we enable them to to provide us insights into how we can better our financial position, Uh, KYC. So even the simple concept of providing your banking statement as part of a onboarding journey is utilizing your data for KYC and something that Open Banking again is in place to support with from a show to help streamline those journeys uh, for mitigation behavioral analysis. All of these are, again, as mentioned, use cases that exist as of now, um, but the manner in which they are implemented or the manner in which they are used is somewhat restricted prior due to the lack of access to to uh, the data to enhance these services. And then if we also look on the other side of things and look at the current growth of machine learning and AI over the last few years and also the predicted growth, we can see that it's uh, been an exponential uh increase over over the last um well, since 2016 and i'm sure many of us are aware of, and probably use a variety of these tools whether it is chat gpt uh google gemini whatever the case may be um from my perspective these are going to become a lot more accessible for each and every individual in their day-to-day life and a lot more embedded in our general um, experiences and I think even from a business perspective these tools are going to be utilized for powering a variety of use cases that might not be covered as of now and if we look at the need or the ability to cover things such as behavioral analysis or to have or look at data sources that were not otherwise used to, to assess an individual's credit worthiness and going through all of these different processes of finding and identifying data that can actually be used to give a better insight into into an individual's financial status than what is currently being used. Uh, uh, Machine learning processes are perfect for that kind of iterative assessment for going through that process of checking all of these different data types and going through all of these different tests to understand and figure out where is the best place to look when actually assessing a given individual under given circumstances. So I think we'll continue to see services like machine learning and AI power services being coupled with open banking data to then provide a variety of outputs that we most likely lead to a much, much greater uh, uh, and broader offering of, um, of data-powered use cases in the open banking space. And I think one other thing to take into consideration, of course, is the fear that people may have in regards to artificial intelligence and, uh, 
um, machine learning. Um, but if we look at things from uh, a a, a like psychological perspective, like the risk perception gap refers to the difference uh, between how like much risk something actually poses and how risky people perceive it to be. And I think that closes over time as more and more information is made available and these things become more and more prevalent within within uh, the market and within uh, an individual's um, range of access. So uh, um, going back to the use cases, that, that there's a variety of ways that open banking can be used for all of the use cases that we discussed. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'll just cover one or two of these, but enhanced credit scoring. So uh, creating a uh, view of an individual's credit worthiness, combining traditional and non-traditional data sources is something that allows for a lot more flexibility from a bank's perspective. A bank doesn't want to turn down an individual who they feel would actually be a potentially a good a good uh, creditor, um, sorry, a, a good credit recipient and um, being able to make more, more um, positive decisions based on more accurate data and information on an individual is something that I think benefits both parties and allows for uh, a massive impact, particularly let's say in the SME space and in countries where the, where individuals are unlikely to have long, any form of long-term credit score, uh, credit history, or might have a negative credit history, but uh, um, are still w w in a much better position now than they were prior to when that history was created. Like there's a lot of, of scenarios and opportunities that aren't accounted for purely utilizing um, the traditional methods. And I think there is a massive, massive opportunity there. And behavioral and predictive analytics, I think is something that is already massively in play. During my time at Barclays, I was working in the uh, data product and science team within cards and payments and um, had uh, amazing opportunities to actually build out models that were able to really understand our customers and help us to understand them better so that we can ensure we provide them products that best align with their needs and I think uh, open banking only enhances that opportunity because you're now enabling yourselves to access even greater ranges of data which give you a much clearer view of your customer and allow for you to understand and build and offer products that align with their needs and requirements. Um, and then we just have an example here of uh, uh, concepts that aren't necessarily captured within the credit uh, bureau data, but uh, can be utilized to support uh, the ability for an individual to obtain credit. So ensuring that uh, an individual that makes regular rent payments might not be shown on their, on their score, but being able to introduce that information through open banking is something that can lead banks to have or build a more favorable uh, persona on that individual. And then finally, we move over into implementing open banking use cases. So um, in terms of the process in which um, I perceive is best to go through, go, uh, through uh, implementing an open banking or open finance use case, that regardless of the industry that you're in. So one is, to, I would say, start well, of course, to start within the definition of the use cases that are the, defined in the given framework. So um, I think it's a step-by-step -step process to ensure for the actual uh, development of the open banking space and to ensure for the consistent uptake of these services. And it requires us to focus initially on those core capabilities, building out those core use cases, uh, account aggregation use cases, personal finance management use cases, uh, merchant payment use cases, like looking at how we can build that underlying infrastructure and then look at how that can then be used to build out even more complex and interesting use cases later on down the line. Um, secondly, of course, understanding where there is a genuine opportunity to generate impact and value both for the customers as well as, of course, for the TPP. So, um, enhancing diversity of products and services, of course, is something that benefits the customer because of the fact that they may be significantly restricted as of now as to what 
they might have access to. Uh, they have the opportunity to enhance their financial literacy, let's say through peer personal finance management applications. Um, it allows for a much more inclusive structure uh, through higher bank account penetration, clear revenue generation and opportunities for the TPP, of course, are massively important when selecting a, a use case to build upon uh, and, of course, creating opportunities for businesses and individuals to build a better financial future. Um, looking at, Thirdly, we have like looking at what the market can cater to now. So um, kind of linking to the first point, um, I think understanding where the market is, both from a technical perspective as well as from a, a uh, like, let's say, a mental perspective, understanding how willing people are to actually go for or utilize specific concepts or use cases within open banking. And going back to the idea of uh, AI and ML powered models, there's still, I would say, a bit of hesitancy from the general consumer as to how they, or as to whether or not they're willing to allow for their data to be used for those reasons. So going through that process of understanding where the general consensus sits now and and targeting use cases that fit into that space is what i believe will lead to a lead to that continued progression and lead to people being more and more um, willing to then utilize services both on the ais and PIS side that might be a bit more complex and might be a bit uh, out, of, uh, out of their comfort zone but they've already received the benefits from those simpler use cases, so they're more willing to uh, utilize the utilize the, the more complex ones later on down the line. And um, finally, uh, simplicity is key. Uh, it's massively important for us to ensure that one, from a framework perspective and from a regulatory perspective, that it, things are in place to ensure for as streamlined a journey for both well, for the financial institution, the TPP, and the uh, end user, um, but also ensuring that the use cases themselves are actually solving a problem and are actually leading to uh, journeys being simplified, uh, capabilities being provided that impact that individual's uh, day-to-day life, make things easier for them, and actually solve the problem. Um, it's all good and well building out use cases, using all of these services and capabilities, but um, there needs to be a genuine benefit there. And making one's life simpler, I think, is something that it goes a long way in terms of the uh, overall perspective of what open banking can do uh, in for, for 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 a given end user. Um, uh, thank you all for taking the time to uh, listen, and I will be happy to cover any questions that are to be shared. All right, thank you for that very informative presentation. Now it's time to open the floor for questions from our audience. So please feel free to type in your questions to the Q&A box. And while we are waiting for questions, I just want to make a few announcements. So for those audience right now who are not yet a member of International Trade Council, so please feel free to reach out to me because we can offer free membership. Also, this webinar is recorded and it will be uploaded to ITC YouTube channel. And you should receive a certificate of participation in the next few days uh, for attending this webinar. So um, there are some questions here right now. Uh, I'll just project the question on the screen. So the first question is, um, what are sandboxes? Can you guys still hear me? I can't seem to hear. Okay, I think I can hear now. Can you hear me? Wrong? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, the first question is, what are sandboxes? Perfect. Uh, uh, great question. Thank you for sharing. So, uh, sandboxes refer to um, a isolated environment that are used for testing open banking services, and it's not just for open banking. It's not specific. It's a technical concept um, where, let's say, you integrate with the APIs, but the data that is accessed is fixed. You're not actually reaching into someone's bank account, you're just reaching into some sandbox data, which is there to uh, to provide a similar journey to as to what it would look like if you were reaching into the account. 
So um, I can give an example, like in, in my current company, Fintech Galaxy, we have sandboxes in place that allow for our clients to test their solution to build it out before going into production. Um, so it's a fundamental part of going through that process of, of testing and then moving your solution into, into, into its production format. All right, thank you. Um, next question. Um, how far has open banking been developed in, U in the UAE? Uh, great question. So the UAE has just recently released their uh, initial draft of the open banking framework and are currently holding workshops to discuss those the core components. So um, interestingly, you have gone for a quite an interesting approach. They are building out a centralized platform that is being um, managed by uh, the central bank themselves. So as opposed to a TPP having to integrate with each bank directly, um, the banks all integrate with the central platform. The TPPs just integrate direct with that one central platform and then access all of the open banking services through that platform. So that's something that I haven't actually seen or experienced myself, um, but it's a very interesting concept and it's expected, I believe, to go live towards the end of this year. So um, they're moving quite quickly um, and I would assume that they would have at least uh, some of the core use cases enabled by Q3, Q4 latest. All right, thank you. Um, next question. Um, how safe is open banking when account can access and post the risk of fraudsters? Um, I think that's a, another great question. Um, in terms of the risk, so one of the core components of, uh, let's say, PSD2 was the introduction of um, the strong customer authentication as a requirement uh, for accessing your account. Uh, and I think these concepts have been brought into each and every framework that I've had the ability to read through when it comes to ensuring that the access is validated in a manner that is very difficult for fraudsters to 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 uh, copy. And I don't think there's a massive amount of difference in terms of the ability for someone to access someone's account as of now in comparison to how they them accessing someone's account through open banking. Um, it's a case of the bank, again, also ensuring they have those protections in place uh, as defined by the as defined by the regula regulator in the specific country. Um, and there's a lot going on at the moment to ensure that these things are very difficult for individuals to hack. Uh, so whether it is the utilization of biometrics, whether it is uh, two-factor authentication, and there's a lot of things that are in place now to significantly reduce the risk of 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 uh, of fraud of fraud occurring on the, in these journeys. All right, thank you. So um, we don't have enough time to uh to get more questions, but um, if you would like to know more about or have questions to our speaker, please feel free to reach out to him. Tola, if you could type in your email address in the chat box, so if anyone would like to reach out to you, um, they can um, email you directly. Perfect, I'll send that across now, thank you. But thank and, you all for taking your time to, to join and thank you for putting sure. this together, Ron. Sure, and um, uh, some of them would like to have a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. Can we share it to them? Yeah, that's that's perfectly fine. Sure. Um, for anyone or those anyone who would like to have a copy of the PowerPoint, is please feel free to um, email me and I'll share the, the copy of the presentation. So before we end the webinar, anything that you would like to add as a final uh, words before uh, we close the webinar? Um, just uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions. Happy to discuss uh, any particular topics in more detail and I uh, appreciate you all for joining. Thank you. So as we conclude our webinar, I want to express my gratitude to our esteemed speaker for their insightful contribution and to all of you, our engaged attendees, for your active participation. So from exploring the transformative potential of open banking to showcasing practical application across sectors, 
We've seen how innovation is shaping our future landscape. Let's carry this momentum forward, embrace the opportunities of open finance to create more efficient, customer-centric, and data-driven solution. Thank you all for joining us on our enlightening journey, and here's to navigating the ever-changing landscape of finance together. Thank you for your time, and you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Tala. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a great day.